Well, good morning, everyone. Well, it's a beautiful spring day outside, so I know we can get a little bit better response. I know it's early, especially for those assigned to Army Materiel Command. Good morning. It's great to see all of you here and what is already proving to be another great event for our United States Army, for Huntsville, for Redstone Arsenal, for our industry partners, and the greater Tennessee Valley community. General Sullivan, thank you so very much for the kind introduction. But most importantly, thank you for your continued sterling leadership of AUSA. We always need your voice and we appreciate your voice. And most importantly, what AUSA does for our Army, the American soldier, and for our families. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please join me in a round of applause for our 32nd Army Chief of Staff and the CEO and President of AUSA. Well, as I mentioned, spring is in the air and so is the pollen. And I'm fighting it today pretty tough, uh, but it's going to be a great day. I'm also very honored to have my good friend, General Dave Perkins and his team from TRADOC as they kicked off the forum yesterday, and I was pleased to hear his remarks on TRADOC's strategy for implementing and achieving the Army operating concept when in a complex world. And since we're in football country, I thought I'd use a quote from uh, a legendary football coach, Vince Lombardi. And he said, and I quote, winning is not a sometime thing, it's an all-time thing. You don't win once in a while. You don't do the right thing once in a while. You do them right all the time. And that's what our nation expects of our United States Army. Each time it's called on the field to accomplish some mission around the world. And so to have that Army conduct that and take on that huge responsibility, it must be ready. I think those of you who were here yesterday morning uh, to witness the panel that followed General Perkins' uh, exceptional presentation, uh, was truly impressed with the information they discussed, and it had to provoke thought for you as you left uh, this forum and headed out uh, for the forum during the day. At AMC, we're on board in, in full support of TRADOC and the department. In his strategy for a strategy slide, General Perkins laid out the ends, ways, and means. And AMC is heavily involved in all six efforts. In particular, the Army Warfighting Challenge, number 16, set the theater. AMC's primary mission of enabling and sustaining Army readiness to win in a complex world, a world that is already complex and becoming more complex with each passing day will be essential going forward. And while we face many challenges across our Army with funding and sequestration, uh, reduction in our force, I remain highly confident that as a result of this strong teaming and collaboration between TRADOC, ForceCom, and AMC, under the great leadership of my teammates, Dave Perkins and Mark Milley, the strongest I've witnessed since serving as a general officer, our nation will continue to have the best trained, the best led, and the best equipped Army in the world. And we're committed to that and working together to make sure that happens. Much has changed in the world since I spoke at last year's symposium. We have seen the rise of the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Order within Yemen is splintering, verging on civil war. Nuclear negotiations with Iran remain delicate. Extremists in North and West Africa terrorize innocents. In Europe, the ceasefire in Ukraine remains fragile. In the Pacific, China's military modernization and North Korea's cycle of provocation continues to concern our allies in the region. Humanitarian and disaster relief efforts such as the Ebola outbreak in Western Africa and floods in Pakistan 
a representative of the unpredictable nature of the missions that our Army will continue to be called upon to execute. Meanwhile, terrorism is growing rather than receding, and threats to the homeland are constantly evolving, as you see in the press every day. The speed of global insecurity is increasing, and ours remains a very dangerous and complex world. During his testimony to Congress earlier this year, our Army Chief of Staff, General Odierno, said this is the most uncertain national security environment that he has seen in his nearly 40 years of service. I think this describes the current complex world that General Perkins was speaking about yesterday. And America's Army, when called upon, it is expected to win. At AMC, operational tempo reflects the Chief's statement. It's the business I've seen since I've assumed command in August of 2012, supporting Army and joint operations and contingencies around the world. Our Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General Allen, visited yesterday, and he was quoted as saying about 80 percent of the contingency requirements that have emerged over the past year were filled by the Army, by the United States Army. So we have been consuming readiness as fast as we've been able to generate it for most of 2014. And our Army is now supporting five named operations on six continents with nearly 140,000 soldiers committed, deployed or forward stationed in over 140 countries. At AMC, we have over 1,100 soldiers deployed, one-third of the uniform assigned to my command, and nearly 4,300 civilians, Department of the Army civilians deployed along with their contractor teammates, forward stationed supporting these missions. Across the Atlantic, as described by Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, we saw the first utilization of the newly built battalion-sized European activity set when elements of the 1st Cavalry Division, 1st Team, deployed from Fort Hood, Texas, fell in on 2,400 pieces of equipment, of a combat equipment, and within four days were out training with France, Latvia, Lithuania, and Germany, doing multinational training exercises. Working closely with U.S. Army Europe and the 21st Theater Sustainment Command, AMC is currently in the process of building a brigade size set that the 1st Brigade of the 3rd Infantry Division will fall in on this September to conduct exercises in response to Russian aggression in Eastern Europe. During the period of October of last year to March of 2015, the Army Sustainment Command Surface Deployment and Distribution Command and the Army Contracting Command deployed over 200 AMC personnel and nine ships with 270, 274,000 cubic feet of equipment and materiel to West Africa in support of U.S. Africa Command. At the height of the Ebola crisis, delivering soldier support facilities, contingency contracting, capability, port opening, operations, and supporting rotary wing aircraft maintenance. Our Research Development Engineering Command developed new blood testing devices and transport enclosures to be used aboard Army Aviation Aircraft in the event we had to transport patients. And the Army Aviation and Missile Command supported the 101st Airborne Division's five-month deployment to Liberia, De deploying aviation logistics assistance representatives and shipping 10 containers of equipment from its theater equipment package facility in anticipation through the foresight of Major General Richardson to ensure that Major General Valeski's requirements to keep his division helicopters flying once they arrived in country. Meanwhile, in the U.S. Central Command, Working in concert with our strategic partners, the U.S. Transportation Command and the Defense Logistics Agency, AMC units accomplish the exceedingly complex mission of retrograding millions of tons 
of equipment and materiel from a landlocked country. With the majority of those operations conducted under combat conditions, the images currently on the screen of our retrograde yard in Bagram Airfield in Afghanistan for those who visited. The image, the inset image was taken in January of 2012 when I visited and looked out and knew we had two years to move that plus about 48,000 vehicles out of the country. And the larger picture was taken this past January, reflective of the enormity of this highly complex mission. This has been a quiet and mostly unhurled success. PhD level logistics, executed by extraordinary army logisticians, and for which our nation should be very, very proud. There's no other capability like this in the world with these great men and women who accomplished this along with their DA civilian teammates and our contractors. Consider these numbers at the war's peak. There were 820 NATO bases of various sizes across Afghanistan. There are now less than 25. Our Army had approximately 48,000 vehicles from strikers and MRAPs to Hemet fuelers and Humvees. Stretched end to end, they would cover the distance from Washington, D.C. to Daytona Beach, Florida. There are now less than 4,800. And there are over 100,000 20-foot containers with every piece of equipment and material imaginable. Across hundreds of these bases, that number is less than 800. A truly phenomenal and historic accomplishment not seen since World War II. Done behind the scenes with very little fanfare, ahead of schedule, and under initial budget estimate that only your United States Army could accomplish. In commenting about the retrograde operations, Honorable Brad Carson, our Under Secretary of the Army, stated, and I quote, the comparative strategic advantage of the U.S. military's logistics and sustainment. I could not agree more. The retrograde is even more remarkable when one considers that it was accomplished simultaneously with all the other missions I previously mentioned, along with reestablishing logistics capability back into Iraq, which is probably one of the most challenging missions we face today, having brought out all, all of that infrastructure at the end of about 2011. To support the deployment of the 1st Infantry Division's advise and assist mission as part of Operation Inherent Resolve, and transitioning mission support in Afghanistan to the Resolute Support Mission set that continues to this day under the leadership of General J.C. Campbell. Also in support of CENTCOM, our engineers from the Research Development Engineering Command and the Chemical Material Activity at Aberdeen Proving Ground, designed, engineered, and constructed a field deployable hydraulic system, first of its kind, and deployed specialists from the Engineer Chemical Biological Center in Maryland to the Mediterranean Sea aboard the MV Cape May, Cape Ray. While aboard ship for approximately six months, the team of Army engineers successfully neutralized more than 600 tons of chemical weapons from Syria. Again, with a little fanfare, ahead of schedule, under budget, and most importantly, without incident. And as our country continues its rebalance towards the Pacific, AMC in support of General Vince Brooks and U.S. Army Pacific supported the Pacific Pathways training deployments to Thailand, South Korea, the Philippines, Australia, and Indonesia. These deployments provide our Army a larger semi-permanent presence in the Pacific Rim. And AMC is providing the logistics and sustainment support along with the personnel to make this happen. In July of this year, AMC will formally stand up an Army Field Support Brigade in Hawaii in support of General Brooks to expand AMC's mission command in support of the PACOM Theater. AMC has also supported several battalion-level rotational force deployments to South Korea, where entire units, not just individuals, are deployed to the peninsula. 
We're in the process of preparing for the first brigade rotational force to Korea this summer, when 1st Cavalry Division, their second brigade combat team, deploys later this year. This BCT rotation will clearly demonstrate U.S. commitment, capability, and resolve to the Republic of Korea, ensuring economic stability in that region of the world. And on the foreign military sales front, USASAC, under the leadership of Major General Mark McDonnell, remains fully engaged, supporting every combatant command and their theater cooperation, security cooperation efforts. We would currently uh, open cases in 158 countries and new cases in FY14 totaling over $20.7 billion. We're on track to exceed $15 billion in FY15. And here in CONUS, AMC continues supporting the Army's downsizing with the realignment of BCTs and the reorganization of 20 brigades across the Army in 2015 alone, which involves an enormous amount of equipment and material that has to be moved and disposition to ensure that we support future Army readiness in support of a conus based Expeditionary Army in transition. All of these efforts in support of our Army were accomplished while enduring the devastating effects of sequestration, personnel reductions at our two-star and above headquarters, approximately 36 percent decline in our budget from FY12 to FY13, and a reduction in our workforce by over 10,000. To say we're being stretched is an understatement. I'm not certain we can continue with the pace we're being called upon without the necessary resources to meet those requirements that continue to grow around the world. To lessen the impact, we're working with Forcecom and TRADOC to return many maintenance and sustainment tasks back to our soldiers, ensuring they remain proficient in their basic tasks of install, operate, and maintain that they increase their unit's deployability and sustainment and save valuable resources in the process. For instance, with, in coordination with FORCECOM and our program executive offices, CECOM under the leadership of Major General Bruce Crawford reduced the number of C4ISR field service representatives and field software engineers by more than 500, avoiding $100 million in the process. We continue to drive for efficiencies in the Army's organic industrial base, which serves as our nation's readiness insurance policy and remain essential to our ability to maintain current fleet readiness and meet surge requirements for future contingencies. Even though their recent activity has declined as we complete the reset of equipment from the peak of combat operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, we're leveraging every opportunity to push work to these facilities while preserving the highly skilled artisan workforce that makes them so valuable to our Army, to the Department of Defense, and to the nation. To reduce the impact, we're leveraging foreign military sales to provide work to the industrial base. And we're seeking to grow public-private partnerships. These business arrangements not only benefit private companies who need skilled workers and advanced facilities. They enhance our preparedness to keep these facilities operating and their workforce employed while generating profit. By the end of 2015, we project that we will have 276 active partnerships generating over $300 million in revenue, and we're always looking for more. As we plan for the force of 2025 and beyond, you may ask how AMC is supporting the Army's ability under TRADOC's lead to win in this complex world. First and foremost, we're focused on sustaining and developing the capabilities the Army needs with the resources the Army has in order to win in tomorrow's complex world. And we do this by providing readiness, readiness to the current force and building readiness for the future force. Among the many ways we're enabling our Army's readiness is through the modernization and sustainment of our Army prepositioned stocks and these activity sets that I spoke about earlier. They allow units to quickly deploy from Conus 
and fall in on equipment that is maintained in the highest state of readiness. Second, AMC is fully aligned with TRADOC as they assess the warfighting challenges in support of the AOC, all while providing combatant commands with theater-enabling capabilities to support a globally responsive, regionally engaged, and ready force. As General Perkins described yesterday, the Army operating concept envisions a future Army that has adapted to be expeditionary, tailorable, and scalable. And the Army provides the enabling foundation for the Joint Force. AMC is the logistics and sustainment component of that foundation, no capability, and has primary responsibility for warfighting challenge number 16, set the theater, sustain operations, and maintain freedom of movement. From aviation and missiles to ground combat vehicles, from C4ISR to contracting and foreign military cells, from munitions to research development and engineering, from installation logistics to the destruction of chemical weapons, AMC is all in. And third, working with TRADOC and the Army's Capability Integration Center, ARCIC, under the leadership of Lieutenant General H.R. McMaster, our Chief Technology Officer, Mr. Patrick O'Neill, and already come led by Major General John Warden, we must drive innovation and align potential future capabilities with validated requirements. AMC manages a comprehensive S&T portfolio, averaging $6.5 billion annually, and is working towards the development of solutions which will make our Army's equipment and materiel more efficient, more lethal, more reliable, safer, and less expensive to operate and maintain, reducing the logistics burden for the individual soldier and the unit. In a moment, you'll hear from a distinguished panel as they discuss science and technology and how we can ensure the U.S. Army maintains this technological overmatch in the coming decades. However, before you do, I'd like to share just a few examples of our current as well as deep future initiatives to equip our soldiers. As well known, our Army aviation is the envy of the world and the workhorse of recent combat operations in the Middle East. Our remarkable aviation capabilities have allowed our Army to dominate the battle space. And now the joint multi-role technology demonstrator is going to help ensure we maintain that aerial overmatch. This demonstrator is providing the foundation to replace our aging aviation fleet with the type of future vertical lift capabilities that will someday allow our soldiers to fly farther and faster, carry more payload with less fuel, and be easier to maintain. Our scientists and engineers at the Aviation and Missile Research Development and Engineering Center, in partnership with industry, are working to conceptualize the technologies required for these future aircraft. While AMR DEC is working to grow the capabilities of our helicopter fleet, our U.S. Army Natick Soldier Research Development and Engineering Center in Massachusetts is working to miniaturize one of the fleet's capabilities, aerial surveillance, through an effort called the Cargo Pocket Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Program, or CPISR. We're working to provide soldiers with a palm-sized aerial surveillance device to give them real-time video of not only what's over the hill or around the corner, but what's in the next room or down the hall. We're also working to ensure that CPISR can work in low light environments, allowing them to function at night, indoors, or underground, areas where traditional satellite, helicopter, and larger over the hill unmanned area systems are not usually applicable. While these technologies provide amazing capabilities, they come at a price, a heavy price in terms of batteries. While we're working to reduce the size and increase battery life, our researchers at Natick are also exploring ways to turn soldiers into their very own generators. With the aid of the soldier-borne energy harvesting and distribution technologies, we can use the body's natural movements to our advantage. For instance, the kinetic energy can be harvested 
when a soldier's backpack accelerates while walking or running, and a device attached to the upper and lower legs can capture energy from those same movements. Solar panels can also cover a soldier's backpack and helmet, all feeding a miniature power generator to recharge batteries and provide power for soldiers' communications equipment, sensors, or battlefield situational displays. Our scientists at the Army Research Lab have also made devices and made advances in neurotechnology research, which will help us better understand the physiological signals being sent from the body and brain. Breakthroughs in this area will allow scientists to monitor changes in a soldier's physical state and then predict fluctuations in performance and potential dangers addressing the human dimension of the Army operating concept. We've also begun work on the augmented reality sand table, or AARES, which is a generational improvement to the traditional sand table we used when I was a brigade commander. I must admit, when I saw it yesterday, I could not believe my eyes and what this capability will bring to a BCT or a battalion commander or a company commander or a team or squad. It's pretty fascinating to be able to see. This low-cost mechanism essentially puts the battlefield in the hands of the warfighter by first displaying the intended landscape on the sand and then allowing the user to sculpt the terrain to their needs. Planners can make judgments based on scenarios with maneuvers, weapons effects, and anticipated environmental changes like water flow. Operators can also better prepare to visualize a mission before undergoing it. These are just a fraction of the cutting edge technologies we are currently developing for the force of 2025 and beyond. I encourage you to stop by the Army booth because much of what I've talked about is on display down there today. In the South Exhibit Hall, where you can talk with subject matter experts, soldiers who are actually using this equipment, scientists and engineers who are in the process of developing these technologies. But we're not waiting until 2025 to develop the follow-on technologies for the Army of 2030 and 2040. While many of the material solutions for the force of 2025 are already in development, AMC is conducting the basic research that will yield the yet unforeseen innovations for the force of 2040. Innovations that may seem science fiction today, but will be science fact in the future. One potential area is the field of quantum science, which could lead to faster, more effective, and more secure communications networks. Another area involves research into novel materials, which are created using quantum science. This research may lead to advanced quantum computing and quantum encryption. They could also allow the manufacturer of ultra-low power electronics. Our scientists are also unraveling the complex relationships between polymer chemistry, microstructure, and energy absorption to create the advanced polymers needed to protect our soldiers against the threats they'll face in 20 or 30 years. Again, these technologies represent only a fraction of the great work that's coming out of our AMC R&D centers. However, we also understand it takes a team effort, government, industry, and academia, to produce R&D successes that our Army will need in the future to continue to win in a complex world. So we're committed to working together with you to develop the next game-changing technology breakthroughs. For our Army engineers and scientists, this is truly an exciting time. Before I conclude, I would like to thank our defense industry for what you and your companies do for our returning veterans. The men and women who have worn the uniform of our armed forces and their families have sacrificed a great deal for our country and they continue to do so in more than 140 countries around the world. And that's so our, the vast majority of the nation can enjoy the American dream in peace. Their nation called and they answered the call. 
So when they call seeking an employment opportunity, I would ask that you take the time to answer their call. And if you cannot provide them an opportunity, please point them in the right direction. Their talent, their dedication, their selflessness, and their commitment is unparalleled. And it's certainly part of the strength that can continue to make our defense industries the best in the world. I want to again thank General Sullivan and AUSA for the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you this morning. And thank you for your continued support of our great United States Army. Hua. How is AMC expanding collaboration on the requirements definition? Um, since the, uh, and, and this is not anything before, but H.R. McMaster, um, his arrival there at ARCIC uh, has been a game changing in terms of his collaboration and his outreach across all the organizations that are involved. Not only just AMC, but also ASALT and the Army staff. Um, and the connection you can see is very real. You saw it on display yesterday. And it's a team effort. As we developed the requirements process, I think in the past decade, uh, supporting two wars simultaneously, we took off the ball a little bit. We had to get equipment out to the field. We had to get it to the soldiers in time and the units to be able to accomplish their mission. And maybe we didn't do as much of the requirements definition as we needed to. I think sometimes we were chasing technology. And so as General Perkins talked about yesterday, it's all about in ways and means. It's all about uh, collaboration. It's all about relationships early on in the process. So we can look at not only uh, are we building the capability that's going to meet and ends, but also can we sustain that capability for the long term. 60 to 90 percent of the cost of a capability or system is in sustainment, life cycle sustainment. And we must do a better job up front in the requirements process, or we will continue to build systems that are unaffordable and unsustainable and therefore non-deployable. How is your ERP system contributing to your mission accomplishment? Is LMP an Army success story? Um, it is contributing to our success. Um, we certainly haven't uh, taken it as far as we want to go. It is a learning process as we continue to leverage uses of LMP to be able to improve our business processes. But the answer as a whole is yes. It's moving us in the right direction. It's helping us gain efficiencies across the command. And we'll continue to look for better ways to employ LMP and better ways to train our personnel in the usage. And so we've got great uh, initiatives ongoing to be able to do that. Uh, but the answer at the bottom line, yes, it is. Any other questions? Uh, apparently not, sir. Thank okay, you very much. Okay, well, look, thank you all very Big much again, General Sullivan. Thank you, sir. Of course.